So we are live, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And of course, there are no classrooms right now. All of you are joining live at home on YouTube, and so thank you so much for tuning in as we continue to highlight amazing scientists, explorers, and facilities around the globe. So today, a couple notes before we get started. One is that for those of you who have tuned into our past Zoo sessions, we are continuing with the Slido app. So I'll put this in the YouTube chat bar, but if you go to Slido and use the event code SLEEP, we'll be doing some polls there, some games, and you guys can type in questions and upvote your favorites. So do check that out. And of course, this continues our series with the Toronto Zoo, our fourth session with them, uh, while all of you guys have been stuck at home. And so today we are in the Africa Pavilion and we are gonna learn a little bit about sleep, how various animals go to bed, some really cool nocturnal animals and more. Um, we are joined live by Mary Ellen Fraser at the zoo. And so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to her to take us away and uh, highlight some really cool creatures. Thanks so much for joining us, Mary Ellen. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jesse. Hi, everyone. So my name is Mary Ellen. Like Jesse said, I work here at the Toronto Zoo in our learning and engagement department. I'm a programs coordinator. Um, I'm very excited to have you all here with me today. If you're coming back for your fourth video with us, welcome back. This is your first time. I'm so excited to have you with us. Um, so even though the Toronto Zoo is actually closed right now, that doesn't mean we've stopped caring for our 5,000 animals that call our zoo their home. And we're gonna meet a couple of them as we walk around our African Rainforest Pavilion today and figure out why sleep is important, how these animals sleep, um, and what it really does for them, their cool adaptations that they have that help them sleep. So similar to our last couple of videos, we actually have a riddle of the day for you. So I'm gonna introduce it now. And before I bring it out, I know Jesse's gonna be overwhelmed with these answers. So the answer is going to be a uh, behavior or an adaptation or something like that that describes an animal. Um, and multiple animals can have it. It's never gonna be just one single animal's name. Um, and if you think you know the answer, I'm gonna say it at some point today in my talk, then you can write it in the Slido chat, in the YouTube live chat. And if you're the first one to guess it right and Jesse sees it, you're gonna get a shout out at the end of the video. So to introduce today's riddle, Changing temps can make me mad. It's a skill I lack, and that makes me sad. When the cold comes to stay, I must go and hide away. So I'll give everyone a quick second here. You can kind of zoom in on it, maybe write it down, take a screenshot if you want. So again, I will be saying the answer to our riddle as we walk around today. So before we get started, let's talk a little bit about sleep. Why is sleep important? And we all do it in some form or another. For humans and for a lot of animals, when we're sleeping, it's a chance for our body to reset and kind of rejuvenate itself. You can grow, your brain takes a little bit of a break, and you're able to kind of reset uh, your body for the next day that you're going to be living and participating and jumping around in. So let's see some of our adaptations for our animals. Now, I warn you guys right now, it's going to get a little dark in here, and we'll explain why some of our animals maybe like to sleep better or uh, live better in the dark. So if follow me to our bat cave. All right, so I know I just introduced it as our bat cave, uh, but our first animal that we're going to see is actually called a naked mole rat. Uh, so these guys, if you have a hamster or gerbil at home, they probably look pretty similar to what you're used to there. And these guys are really cool creatures. Now, I mentioned it's dark in here. Um, that's not necessarily because they sleep at night or are active at night, so a nocturnal animal. Um, that's more because they live underground. And if we pan up and see their entire exhibit here, you can see that they have a lot of tunnels and tube systems, um, a tube city, if you will. And that's where these guys like to run around. So they would be digging these tunnels in the wild for themselves. Um, and they have a lot of different tubs that you can see here. So each of these containers, that there's a couple mole rats in each one, they have a special purpose for that colony. So a colony is just a name for a group of mole rats. Each one has a special um, function for the group. So some of them are their bathroom, some of them are their eating chambers, and the big one that we're gonna focus on here, this is their sleeping chamber. So you can kind of see them all wiggling around in there starting to wake up um, and they have a queen in their colony and she'll be sleeping on the bottom and they all huddle in together to stay nice and warm with each other. So these guys sleep for about 12 to 17 hours in a day um, and one of the reasons that they sleep underground and kind of exist underground is they are actually ectothermic. 
So you guys may not have heard that word before. Um, most people think of it as being cold blooded, uh, but ectothermic is more of a proper word. Ecto meaning outside and thermic meaning temperature, which means they need to rely on their outside surroundings in order to control their temperature. And when you're underground, the temperature stays constant more for more of the year. Uh, so they don't have to worry about getting too hot or too cold because they're not able to do that in their body the way humans are. Fun fact, they're actually the only ecto or one of the only ectothermic mammals out there on the planet, which is pretty cool for them as well. We'll get another couple seconds of them. I know they kind of look um, a little interesting sometimes. I think they're quite cute. They are also a famous animal. If you've ever watched Kim Possible, you might see it on Disney Plus. If you're older like me, you might have watched it on TV when you were younger. Uh, Rufus from Kim Possible, he was a naked mole rat. All right, we're gonna head on to our next animal over here. Follow me this way, this nice purpley red tinge to uh, get us some the pretty skies. There's a couple here. They might be a little bit harder to see right now, but these are actually our fruit bats here at the Toronto Zoo. So typically, when you think of a bat, everybody thinks of nocturnal. And that's kind of a big fancy word. So a nocturnal animal is an animal who will be awake at night and asleep during the day. Humans are the opposite of that. We're actually called diurnal. So we're awake during the day and asleep at night. And most people don't know this, but you can have diurnal and nocturnal types of bats in the world. And that's because our fruit bats here, they actually can be awake and active in the daytime because what are they eating? They're eating fruit. And you don't need, um, you need eyesight to see fruit and find their flowers that they're trying to eat. Uh, so they don't actually have to be out and about at night. For other bat species though, being awake at night is a great skill for them because uh, it reduces competition. A lot of animals are diurnal, or a third term is called crepuscular. And that's when an animal is awake first thing in the morning at dawn, and then later again in the evening at dusk. So sunrise and sunset, but then they're asleep during the majority of the day and the majority throughout the night as well. Um, so there's the kind of three levels that you can categorize animals into. And these bats here can be diurnal or nocturnal. Something else that's really cool, you can see our bat right in front of us there giving us a great shot of how these guys kind of hang around. Uh, a little bit of a pun intended there. He's actually hanging by one foot, it looks like. If you could imagine, or if you've ever been to a playground before and you've tried to hold on to monkey bars, eventually your hands get sore and tired from hanging from the bars and you have to let go. And that's because as humans, our relaxed position for our hands is open. And if you wanna grab something or hold on to something, you have to work really hard and think to close your hand and hold it being closed. Now that would waste a lot of energy if you're an animal who has to hold on to something all the time to hang from it. So for bats and a lot of other large birds of prey out there who spend a lot of time perched on things, their relaxed position for their fingers are more of a closed position. So their feet are naturally closed and they can lock out their toes as well. So just like if you think you see a horse or a cow in a field or maybe even a giraffe, they can lock out their legs and stand sleeping up. These guys can lock their toes in place. So when they sleep, they don't have to worry about falling out of their branch at all, which is really cool. So bats as a whole can sleep for a variety of times. Um, they can usually go between 10 to 17 hours a day when they do sleep though, which is pretty, pretty uh, nice long nap for them there. Alrighty, so we're gonna keep going. We're gonna head up to the other parts of our exhibits here. So we're gonna pass it back to Jesse just for a moment as we transfer out of our bat caves and up to our meerkats. We'll get one last quick look at them here and then Jesse will throw it to you. Fantastic. Well, we really appreciate the chance to see your naked mole rats and bats to kick us off. And yeah, we'll dive in as you guys walk up to the next part of the gallery. A few notes for our viewers tuning in at home. This again is not our first session with the zoo. So if you guys haven't seen our others, we've done giraffes and digestion, we've done tundra trek with some of the best animal interactions I've ever seen on camera. And then most recently, we just finished up with them with the Komodo dragons and tree kangaroos in the Australasia exhibit. So if you wanna see some really, really fantastic programming, check out our YouTube channel at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Again, we're gonna be doing 100 broadcasts in the month of April alone, featuring scientists, explorers, and amazing facilities around the globe. 
Uh, you guys are doing great at letting me know where you're joining from and typing in questions already on YouTube. Uh, I like all the answers to the riddle and it has been answered already. So someone has gotten it right already. I'll announce them at the end. If you guys haven't joined us on Slido before, do check that out. You can just type it in. I've linked it in the chat bar. Use the event code SLEEP and you'll have all sorts of great opportunities to take part in games and ask questions. <laughs> so we're back and we're at the Meerkats. I'll turn it back to Mary and uh, Mary Ellen. Awesome. All right, guys. So we have made our journey up to our main section of the African Rainforest Pavilion. And these are our little critters in front of us. I just occurred to me here, we're seeing a lot of pretty famous animals uh, today in our talk. So if you guys have ever seen the Lion King before, you might recognize these creatures. Uh, Timon from the Lion King, that famous duo of Timon and Pumbaa, he is what's known as a slender tail meerkat. So this is Timon here. Now these guys are actually a little bit similar to the creatures we just saw in the back cave, our naked mole rats. Um, if you guys can see around their exhibit, you'll see lots of holes everywhere. And maybe one of them is gonna do a little digging there for us as well. So these guys are excellent skilled diggers, diggers, but unlike the naked mole rats, they spend a lot of their time above the ground as well, looking for food and also looking out for danger. So usually with a group of meerkats, you will see one of them standing up somewhere um, higher than the rest of them, kind of evaluating their surroundings, just to make sure that nobody is coming to hurt them, no hyenas are coming, no predators, there's no bad weather coming their way and that the rest of the group is safe. If you've seen Lion King one and a half, you'll know that Timon is very bad at this job. Um, and he's in fact kicked out of his group because of it. Um, these guys though, when they are sleeping, they will sleep for uh, over 10 hours a day. Um, and they also um, will sleep kind of together as well for warmth. Unlike their naked mole rats though, they are not ectothermic. These guys are endothermic, which is a warm blooded animal like humans. So like I said, with the naked mole rats, most mammals out there in the world, uh, I'd say more the majority of them are warm blooded or endothermic animals, meaning that we can control how our body temperature is on the inside. So you sweat when you get hot and you might shiver when you get cold. And that's ways for us to help try and protect ourselves. All right, we'll give a couple more minutes here to these guys. They seem very interested in us and our camera that we're holding up above their exhibit. Um, they're pretty interested. They don't know who we are or what's going on here. All right, we'll say goodbye to our friends and I'm going to bring you guys over to see. All right, let's see if we can find them here. Um, these guys are quite good at camouflaging, so it's just going to take us a couple seconds to see if we can find them. So most people think that chameleons uh, change color to camouflage, and that's not actually true. Um, although they are very good at hiding in their exhibits, as you can see, right, we're having a couple, a little bit of a hard time trying to locate karma here. Um, they will actually change color based on their feeling or emotion. So they're kind of like a mood ring as an animal. Um, so if they're really happy or excited or feeling good about themselves, they'll be a lighter color. Um, and if they're scared or upset or frustrated, they'll be a darker color. And when these guys are actually asleep, that's when they're at their prettiest. They put on their pajamas for you. Um, so if we look up at our sign here really quickly, you can see these nice bright colors of these chameleons. Um, a lot of them can change really bright and uh, pretty colors, but it's not all the time for them. All right, looks like we might be able to find one of our other ones over here. At the bottom down here. And you guys can let us know in the comments as well if you were able to see Karma in the other exhibit and see if you can see uh, Pascal in this one here. They can be a little bit tricky sometimes. So chameleons are another great example of an animal who is diurnal. So remember an animal who is diurnal uh, spends a lot of time uh, awake during the day and they sleep more primarily at night. Oh, seems like we might have found a little friend up here. Oh. There we go. Just hiding in the back for us. That was, made us work for that one there. You can see he blends in really well to the back of his habitat. Um, so like I was saying, they are a diurnal species. Um, so they're awake primarily during the day um, and they sleep primarily at night. So these guys though, really, they're kind of like a cat with a box. If they fit, they sit. If a chameleon is tired, it sleeps. 
They have really strong feet that help them hold onto their branches really securely. Um, and they will sleep whenever and wherever they feel like it. Uh, it's been said a lot of times people who have chameleons as pets, sometimes they'll come home and their chameleon will be up on the side of their exhibit, uh, taking a little nap, which is kind of cool as well. So you can see our chameleons looking around at us right now. They can rest their eyes. You might be able to see that our chameleons using their eyes independently of one another. And that's a cool adaptation or creature feature to allow them to see around them better. All right, he's giving us a quick look there. So as we missed him in the beginning a little bit, we'll keep, uh, keep here for a second so everyone can get a really uh, good close-up look of karma. All right, so we're gonna head over to our last animal or animals, should I say. Uh, you guys are gonna understand that in just a second. All right, so welcome everybody. This is my absolute favorite fish tank we have here at the zoo. I know that sounds crazy. People always think it's so weird when I say I have a favorite fish tank, but how could you not love this? We'll get a close up in here for you guys so you can see all of our beautiful fish. These are called cichlids. So there's many different types of cichlids fish out there in the world. Um, so you can see in this tank, they're all kind of the same uh, subspecies as each other, uh, but they look all slightly different. And that's because they each have their own special niche to survive in their habitat. And a niche is just a role that an animal plays to help in their habitat. So if you think about it at home, if you clean up your house or you tidy your house or take the garbage out, that's like a role or a niche that you're playing to keep your household going. Fish are quite interesting though for sleeping. Uh, they don't sleep the same way that humans do or any of the animals we've seen previously who sleep for long periods of time. Um, these guys are more intermittent sleepers. So they don't really have eyelids either. Either they have a clear eyelid that goes down over their eye to protect them. Uh, but when they wanna sleep or they get tired, they more or less just kind of slow down their body. They'll slow their heartbeat down and they kind of uh, will be floating a little bit more in the water instead of swimming with any direction. And that's what a lot of fish do is they don't quite sleep. They just kind of have these periods of rest. So instead of being actively moving around, they'll just kind of chill out for a few minutes instead. Alrighty guys, that brings us to the end of our sleep talk here for right now. So before we kind of promo our other things, I think we're gonna switch it back to Jesse. We'll stay here on the fish tank. It's absolutely mesmerizing here. And we'll see uh, who got our riddle answer and uh, take some questions from the audience as well. Fantastic. So yes, first I'm going to announce the riddle winner. So when you guys announced the riddle, we had probably a hundred people type in an answer really, really rapidly. And about 99% of them said hibernate, which is close, but not quite right. So our first person to get it right was Harriet, who said ectothermic, which you brought up at two of our exhibits early on in the thing. So ectothermic is the answer to the riddle, everyone. And congrats to Harriet for getting that first. Um, for everyone online, if you guys want to type questions in the chat bar on YouTube or type them in on Slido and upvote your favorites, I'll take as many as we possibly can uh, while we're here at the Cichlid Tank. We'll also be launching a quiz soon on Slido. So in about five minutes, I'll launch a quiz. You can take part with that if you want to learn a little more while the session is going on. But, Mary Ellen, let's start with a question from Jordan, uh, which is how many meerkats are in that group? Or how many meerkats are in groups in the wild? That's a really good question. So um, Sean has just taken off here for us and he's going to go count how many meerkats we have specifically so we can get a solid answer for you. Um, in the wild though, they can be live in very large groups. So actually a group of meerkats is called a mob, um, which is kind of an interesting name for them. Um, so they live together. They can be upwards, I'd say, of probably uh, 50 individuals in a group. They can live in very large colonies or mobs. Um, right now in our exhibit, we have four of them. Perfect, thank you so much. All right. Uh, Harriet, our, our quiz winner, wanted to know how well chameleons can see. Okay, so how well chameleons can see. So I was mentioning before um, that they can use their eyes independently of, the, of each other. And you see that a lot in animals um, when you can kind of tell for most animals if they're a predator or a prey uh, based on where their eyes are. And chameleons kind of have uh, both of those. And what I mean by that is I'm gonna have Shannon pan back to me for a quick second here. Um, when an animal has their eyes on the front of their face the way humans do, it's often an indication that they are a predator animal. And that's because when your eyes go forward, you get something called depth perception. Personally, I don't have it very much.
much. I'm not very good with my eyesight, but the majority of people do. And a lot of predators think of a tiger or a lion, their eyes are facing you when they hunt. And that's because they don't really need to see what's around them. They need to see their prey that they want to take down and they need to tell how far away their prey is for them. Now, if you're a predator or maybe like a fish like we have here in our tank, your eyes are at the side of your head. So think of like a horse or a cow in this kind of case. And your eyes are at the side because you don't necessarily care about how far away something is from you. You need to see if something's coming to eat you around you at all times. So that's why they're focusing on the outside. So animals with eyes on the front have really precise vision, but a lot of it's just in the front of them. They have to move to see to the side. And animals with eyes on the side of their head have really good peripheral vision. It's not that clear of vision. They can see movement and things like that. Chameleons can actually do both. So because their eyes can move independently of one another and within their head, they're able to see all around them. And then when they focus in on their prey, they direct both their eyes forward. So they're able to see all around them and then look straight forward as well to find their food that they're looking for, which is really cool. Super cool. Uh, one thing I always love highlighting too is that if you look at something like a goat, its pupils are in its eye horizontally and when it tilts its head down, the pupils stay level with the horizon. So no matter which way its head is tilted, it can always see the maximum amount of area around it, which is super neat. All right. Uh, Esme and Olivia from Guelph want to know, with these fish, do they have a favorite place to rest at night or to hide when they're sleeping? Um, so I don't know about the big ones here, but if we come to the side of the exhibit on the left hand side, if you're ever here when the zoo opens back up, um, always check the side and the bottom of the tank um, for the babies. So the big fish will kind of all be in the center of the tank, but the small fish will rest and stay near the sides. And that's a trait that they've kind of developed an adaptation uh, because some of these fish, their niche, so their role is eating other fish. So if the babies or the smaller ones were to swim out into the middle of the tank, they might get eaten um, by one of the bigger fish. So they spend their time resting uh, near the sides and the bottom specifically. Fantastic. Well, for everyone who's watching in from Ontario, when you guys get a chance to go to the zoo in person, you can do check for that in all the fish tanks. It's really, really neat. All right, Ireland in Collingwood wants to know, uh, how long do meerkats live in the zoo and in the wild? And if there's a difference between the two, can you explain a little bit about that? Um, yeah, so, so, so there's definitely um, always, or most often, I should say, a difference uh, for how long an animal can live in captivity and how long they can live in the wild. And that can do for a number of things, how good they are at living in captivity themselves, but then also um, how much vet care they need here. So if an animal is born um, in the wild with um, a disease or an, some sort of ailment or uh, misshapen body part, uh, they probably wouldn't last very long. But here in a zoo, they're going to get the care that they need uh, to uh, help them survive. So in the wild, you'll probably be looking at five years, maybe five to 10 years at most. Um, a lot of meerkats wouldn't survive past that. Um, here in the zoo, though, we can allow them to live probably around 10 years or so. Very yeah. cool. All right. Um, Julia wants to know if baby bats have a specific name. Are they? Oh, are baby. They? Oh, okay. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know out there, um, a lot of animals, when they have a offspring or baby, there's a specific name they're given. So for a baby horse, they're called a foal, a baby cat. They're usually a cub. Uh, for bats, I don't believe there's a specific uh, baby version of a little bat. Um, the ones we've had here, we've always just referred to them as babies. All right, I'll look that up too, just in case, because I've never heard of a baby bat having a name either. So anyway, uh, Dara wants to know, there looks like a lot of fish in that tank. How do you make sure they're all fed? That's a good question. We're going to uh, bring the camera back so you guys can just see exactly how big the tank actually is. You can even see our reflections in it here. Uh, so there's uh, roughly about maybe a thousand-ish fish in this tank. Um, and you can actually see in the middle here, if you come over, you can see a ball in the tank. It's a big purple ball there. Um, and I'm pretty sure that once had some food in them for it. Um, and it would have been used as more of like a delay feeder. So twice a day, if when you come to the zoo, uh, once in the morning and once in the afternoon as well, our keepers will stick a giant net into this tank um, with a bunch of food in it. And they kind of wave it around. And it's quite interesting. You see all of our fish, uh, they look all spread out right now. They will converge and join in 
on that uh, net full of food and they all follow it around. And as the keeper kind of swings the net through the exhibit, they're able to disperse the food around so that all the fish get some. I did mention though that some of the fish have different roles that they play in this exhibit. So some of the fish, their job is to eat other fish and that is where they get their food from. There's also algae and things like that that build up in this exhibit and some of the fish like to eat that. So down at the bottom on the rocks and at the side, you'll see fish down there kind of nibbling on the plants that are growing there as well. Very cool. Uh, you've inspired people with all this fish talk in this beautiful tank. So Max wants to know how many different types of fish do you have at the whole zoo? You know? Oh, in the whole zoo entirely. Oh, um, let me do a quick little count here. I'll mentally walk through the pavilions. Um, we have a couple tanks in this building alone. I would say there's probably 10 tanks in this exhibit or in this um, part of the zoo. And we have a whole part in our Australasia building, which we were in on Tuesday when we looked at animal movement. We have a coral reef exhibit that's home to many aquatic creatures in there. Um, I would probably say we have Sean here doing some quick mental math for us. Um, Da, 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 da. I would say there's 40 or 50 different species here, probably. Very cool. All right. Um, another question on our fish. Um, uh, how many, oh, sorry, not on fish, sorry. Uh, Robin and Jake want to know how many fruit bats do you guys have? Oh, so how many in total? So we have two different types of fruit bats right now. We have straw colored fruit bats and Egyptian fruit bats. Um, we probably have. 10 in total. There was probably only about seven or so in the one exhibit we were looking at. Uh, we have another uh, exhibit where there's uh, four other males who live as well. All right. Uh, we just got a question. Uh, we've got a, we've been getting a lot of questions on how long animals live. So we can just do these in a, in a group. Uh, if you happen to know how long chameleons live or how long bats live, there seems to be a lot of interest in that today. Yeah, for sure. I know there's always that common question of how long an animal can live for. Um, so for a, um, we'll say chameleon first, probably. Um, again, an animal living in the wild versus living in captivity uh, changes their abilities to live um, and kind of how they survive and the quality of life that they have. Um, I would say though for, sorry, it's bats and chameleons we're looking at. Yeah, bats and chameleons. Yeah. Bats and chameleons. Um, for uh, hold on, we're just double checking on our answer here really quickly. One second here. We always love these questions at zoos and aquariums about how long things are, or how fast they are, but sometimes it's not something that everyone readily knows for all the animals in the zoo. So we'll take a second to there's learn. Also, yeah, there's yeah. also 5,000 animals here at the zoo and over 500 different species of animals. So sometimes it can be a lot to uh, remember here. So for a chameleon, the average lifespan is about five years. So again, thinking in captivity and you're able to provide that healthcare, constant food for them, that kind of thing. Uh, they're probably able to live upwards to about 10 years old on average. And bats, I would say about the same. For a lot of animals in the wild, if they survive to adulthood, that itself is an amazing feat. Uh, a lot of animals out there, they have a really hard time. And when they're offspring, that's when they really are uh, troubled with uh, that survival ability. So for uh, bats, they can live approximately 20-ish years or so. Very cool. I just want to note for people tuning in live at home, we did a session with Chris Weir on bats the other day with Travis Steffens on Madagascar animals, where you can learn more about chameleons. And later today, we're working with Ridley's Aquarium of Canada to highlight the fish. So if you're keen on any of these animals, there are more resources that we have out there. Uh, Mary Ellen, we are getting to the end of our session here. And so I want to highlight um, what people at home can do to learn more about the work that you guys are doing at uh, while you guys are closed during these interesting times. Yeah, for sure. So there's lots that everybody can, can do and can get involved with. So at home right now, if you'd like, if you go to the Toronto Zoo website, there's a tab for parent resources. Uh, there's some that are just general resources. And then the Zoo to You is where you can find all of our videos linked to the web page here. But as well, we have resources that match every single video that we do that you guys can do at home to continue your learning. So for example, for this talk that we're doing today, 
you guys can try and map your sleep schedule. We have a little sleep calendar for you to print off at home, as well as map out your house the way a naked mole rat would map out their uh, tunnels and uh, kind of whole areas in their colony as well. So you can try and figure out how you relate to a naked mole rat, which is kind of cute as well. There's also lots more you can do on social media, the Toronto Zoo. We have an Instagram page, Facebook, TikTok even. We have two TikToks. We have Toronto Zoo and the Great Lake TikToks. I encourage you to follow both of them. Um, so you can reach out to us there. We also have our own YouTube page as well. And every day at 1 p.m., we are doing Keeper Talks live across the zoo. So even though we are closed, we are still caring for our animals and our guests as well. So you can tune in and meet a keeper and they'll talk about a specific animal every day at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is really cool. Fantastic. And we'll be continuing our series with the zoo every 11 a.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Again, we've done three talks in the past. This is our fourth. Um, this is so fantastic, guys. And for everyone tuning in at home, thank you so much for tuning in. Do check out more of our videos with the zoo, with other organizations that we are trying to bring some great digital education. Check out our site at exploringbythesea.com. All right, uh, Mary Ellen, thank you so much again for a wonderful session. And uh, we really appreciate you joining us today. Awesome. Thanks so much for having us, Jesse. Bye, everybody. We hope to see you next week. See you soon. Bye.